Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Roger Lee, and I work at Battery Ventures. I'm lucky to be one of the co-hosts of the Marketplace Conference, and I'm very grateful that you're willing to take time out of your busy schedules to be here today. I'm also excited to present my 2021 State of Marketplaces presentation this afternoon. This has been an incredibly exciting year in the land of marketplaces, and I look forward to sharing some of the key takeaways. With that, let's get things kicked off. Before we start, just a quick background on me. As I said a minute ago, I work at Battery Ventures. We're a venture capital firm managing over $9 billion. Our current fund is a $2 billion vehicle. We're totally stage agnostic and will happily invest a half a million dollars to help a founder get an idea off the ground all the way up to a $100 million pre-IPO growth equity investment. We operate globally and we have six offices around the world. Most importantly, we love marketplaces. And this is my favorite slide. Over the past 10 years, we've invested in over 30 different marketplaces, some of which are highlighted on this slide. Our investments range from transactional e-commerce businesses like Wayfair and StockX to content businesses like Glassdoor, local services marketplaces like Angie's List, to travel marketplaces like Hotel Tonight, and financial services and exchanges like Coinbase. Across this marketplace portfolio, we've invested over $450 million. This has been a big area of focus for us. Most importantly, we'll continue to aggressively invest in marketplaces all over the world, so we are definitely open for business. So that begs the question, why do we love marketplaces so much? Why are we investing in marketplaces? The answer is that we look for businesses that fundamentally change the way consumers behave and create a lot of value as a result. And if you look at marketplaces, they've done this in a huge way over the past couple of decades, generating great returns for their investors. However, when you look at the Battery Marketplace Index, which tracks the performance of over 50 publicly traded marketplaces around the world, the performance has been pretty bad over the past year. As you can see represented by the bottom blue line, the index is down 11% since last year compared to the NASDAQ, which is up 31%, and the Dow Jones, which is up 25%. This is probably the worst relative performance we've seen in a long time. So what happened over the past year that drove this underperformance? Why did the marketplace index struggle so much? If I had to sum it up in one word that had the biggest impact, it would be regulation. Regulators around the world are starting to clamp down on big tech companies with a particular focus on the large consumer marketplace businesses. Many of you have seen the headlines here in the US, but it's been particularly difficult in China. We've highlighted a few stories on this slide, but to sum it up, Chinese regulators are aggressively going after the largest consumer marketplaces like Alibaba and Didi. In one extreme example, the regulators effectively ruled that the for-profit online education sector was illegal, banning the industry from making any profits, raising capital, or going public in the future. Needless to say, these regulations had a devastating impact on many companies in the marketplace index. And you can see the impact clearly on this slide. If you look at the bottom line, you can see the performance of just the Chinese companies in the battery marketplace index. That cohort of companies is down almost 30% for the year. And if you look at the bullets at the bottom of the slide, you can see some of the company specific performance with Didi down 42%, Alibaba down 46%, and Gautu down an incredible 97%. In aggregate, the public Chinese marketplaces lost over $450 billion of value over the past year, representing a huge headwind for the index. One big question this raises, though, is what does this mean for the rest of the world? Will other countries follow China's lead, or will the regulatory bodies be more relaxed? It's hard to know for sure, but there are definitely some concerning early signs. The Biden administration in particular has made it pretty clear that they're going to take a hard look at many business practices of the largest U.S. consumer marketplaces, with companies like Uber, Coinbase, Robinhood, and others in their crosshairs. We've highlighted a few examples on this slide, and it'll be interesting to see how this plays out over time. But for all the founders in the audience, you should definitely stay on top of the shifting regulatory landscape in your industry. A few years ago, I never would have thought that our portfolio companies needed to hire lobbyists, but unfortunately, it's becoming an increasingly relevant role. 
However, it's not all bad news. There's actually a lot of good stuff going on in marketplace land. We should cover that as well. First and foremost, 11 companies went public over the past year and graduated into the Battery Marketplace Index. These include iconic businesses that we've profiled over the past couple of years, like Airbnb, Coinbase, DoorDash, Coupang, and Robinhood. And it's awesome to see them continue growing and to hit this amazing milestone. In total, these 11 companies added over $400 billion in value to the index, and many of them are just scratching the surface as they continue to grow. What's really interesting, however, is that this group of 11 IPOs is a microcosm of the broader marketplace index with a wide distribution of performance since their IPOs. As you can see from this slide, four of the companies are trading up since the IPO, while seven of the companies have lost value. At the extremes, you have Airbnb, who's up 26% since their IPO, while Poshmark and Wish are both down 73% and 75% respectively. So this begs the question, what's causing this huge distribution of returns? And what can we as founders and investors learn from the public markets over the past year? Needless to say, there's no one answer. But one important variable is the distinction the market is applying towards companies that are stay-at-home stocks versus recovery stocks. In other words, as COVID starts to subside, which companies will benefit as the world returns to normal? These are the recovery stocks, and you can see them on the right side of the slide. Alternatively, which companies will struggle as the world returns to normal? These are the stay-at-home companies on the left side of the slide. When you look at the performance through that lens, you can see that many of the recovery categories like experiences and travel have done really well. As the world opens up and people start traveling, companies like Airbnb, Expedia, Eventbrite, Lyft, and Uber have all outperformed. Conversely, some of the stay-at-home categories have struggled. In particular, EdTech, digital health, and e-commerce have seen the most pressure as many people return to school, go back to the doctor, or visit a mall. It'll be really interesting to see how these categories do over time, as I'm very bullish on their long-term prospects. But these industries may have gotten overheated during COVID, and the multiples for those companies came down to earth. Double-clicking into some of the underlying details, there are a few additional conclusions. The first is that business model efficiency continues to be a huge predictor of stock price performance. We've talked about this in past Marketplace conference presentations, and this continues to be true. This slide shows stock performance based on each company's Rule of 40 score. As a reminder, the Rule of 40 is the sum of your revenue growth plus your EBITDA margin, and this is a very common way of measuring business model efficiency. As you can see, over the past year, the top quartile of companies as measured on a Rule of 40 basis generated a 30% return, while the bottom quartile lost 1%. Another important driver of stock price performance is growth, and the recovery businesses are showing this in droves. As the world returns to normal, the recovery companies are experiencing their highest growth rates in years. As you can see on the slide, many of the recovery businesses are expecting to grow 50% to 100% this year. Investors are rewarding that renewed growth with higher multiples and surging stock prices. So this begs the question, how should you navigate this new reality? What are some of the key lessons you can learn from the successful public marketplaces as they've navigated these choppy markets? Ultimately, we think this boils down to a single question. When should you focus on growth and when should you focus on efficiency or profitability? Depending on where you are in your journey, the answer to this question will vary. And it's critical that you have 100% alignment with your team and your investors on this issue. Over the next few minutes, we'll share some examples of leading marketplace companies and how they thought about this question to help guide your thinking. So let's start with an early stage business. For the early stage founders in the audience, growth is priority one, two, and three. However, there are a couple of best practices for optimizing early stage growth that you have to keep in mind. First and foremost, you should start with a very narrow problem statement and keep it as simple as possible. In fact, do your best to avoid the temptation of broadening the use case early on, as many early stage companies fail by getting defocused 
and diluting their efforts over a broad product surface area. Iterate quickly and focus deeply on customer engagement, repeat rates, NPS scores, and organic growth loops, anything that shows clear evidence of value creation. And finally, keep things as lean as possible until you find product market fit. One of the biggest mistakes early stage founders make is spending too much on customer acquisition before finding true product market fit with attractive customer engagement. If you can accomplish those things, you'll probably get your Series A financing raised and earn the right to move to the middle box on this slide. This is where, ideally, you use the same product and slowly expand to some adjacent audiences. The best case scenario is that existing users organically pull you there, so it costs very little and you can focus all of your energy on serving those loyal users. Finally, as you start scaling the audience, they will tell you what else to build and you can start to add some additional capabilities. This will allow you to deepen the relationship with your core user base. The key here though is to listen closely to what they're saying and build it for them. One classic example here is Uber. Most people forget this, but their first product was a very narrow use case of a high-end, on-demand black car service. They had a limited number of drivers and cars, and it was only available in San Francisco, but the users loved it. They were intensely loyal, and they told all their friends about the service. Once Uber felt they had real product market fit with that core audience and use case, they leaned into aggressive growth to win the market. Business model efficiency and margins were far less important during this stage of the journey as they focused on growth and market share and offered aggressive incentives to drivers and riders to join the platform. They used their strong product market fit and aggressive growth as the foundation to raise billions in funding, which ultimately allowed them to expand their product to many adjacent use cases, including UberX, Pool, and Uber Eats, while also expanding all over the world. Today, Uber is an $85 billion company, but the platform for that success was laid years ago when the leadership team and investors made the conscious decision to focus on extreme growth and winning the market at the cost of short-term business model efficiency. This was the right decision for Uber and for most of the early stage founders in the audience, aggressively leaning into growth in the early years would be the right call for you as well. Okay. So now that you're growing and getting scale, when should your thinking evolve? Should you always be focused purely on growth? Or should you start to think about business model efficiency and margins and profitability? What are the key questions you as founders should be thinking about and how will investors evaluate your business at the growth stage once you have scale? We would encourage you to think about a few things and we'll dive into these in more detail. First, Think deeply about network effects and how they create defensibility and moats. We're not going to talk about network effects in this presentation, but there's other presenters at the Marketplace Conference that will discuss this, and I would encourage you to listen to their presentations as they'll have some great takeaways. Second, deeply understand the unit or cohort economics of your users. Aggregated or summary financials of a business are very misleading and it's important to show how your users behave as a cohort over time. Finally, once you've done that, can you translate those cohorts into an attractive financial profile where older cohorts of users demonstrate strong margins and profitability? If you can do that and show how your mature cohorts translate into sticky and profitable customers, you'll have investors begging to get involved. A good case study showing the power of cohorted metrics is Robinhood. When Robinhood went public, in addition to their standard financials like the P&L, a balance sheet, and cash flow statements, they explained how their customers behaved over time as measured by annual cohorts. As you can see on this slide, they showed each cohort of customers by the year they joined and the amount of revenue they generated. So for example, the customers who joined in 2017 generated 17 million of revenue in their first year. 62 million in their second year, and 130 million by 2020, their fourth year. The revenue from that customer base grew over 7x from year one to year four, which is incredibly impressive. Even more impressive is that the 2017 cohort is not unique. The 2018 cohort of customers grew from 44 million 
to 186 million, or over 4x growth in three years. And you see similar growth from the other cohorts as well. Explaining the company in this light clearly shows the power of the business. Not only are they growing quickly, but when you look at their performance of the annual cohorts, it clearly shows they have very sticky and loyal customers that love trading on Robinhood. Trust me, nothing creates more value for a business than long-term, highly engaged customers who spend more and more on your product every year. Robinhood's cohorted analysis allowed them to clearly communicate this powerful virtue of their business, and it's one of the key reasons why they're worth over $30 billion today. Another example of the power of cohorts or segmented analysis is Uber Eats. As you can see on this slide, Uber Eats reported Q1 revenue of $12.5 billion with a $200 million loss. Many investors would look at that and quickly conclude that Uber Eats is a cash-burning loser and that Uber should get out of that business immediately. However, when you double-click into the numbers and divide that performance into two cohorts, their investment markets and their profitable markets, the data tells a very different story. What you can see is that their older, more mature markets are quite profitable, and they generated 120 million of positive EBITDA on 3 billion of revenue. Conversely, all of their losses are concentrated in their newer investment markets, where they're still rapidly scaling and fighting for share. Breaking up the data this way shows the power and profitability of the business, and it will give confidence that over time, Uber Eats can be a very profitable business that should continue to invest and win share in their markets. So to summarize, dig into your customers and find the best way to cohort or segment them to tell the true story of your business. Averages or a simple P&L snapshot is very misleading and it won't show the full picture. Okay, so now you've gotten product market fit, you're growing aggressively, and you've proven attractive unit or cohort economics. You're scaling towards an IPO, and you're looking to make your marketplace even more durable and sticky. What do you do? One thing we would strongly recommend to all founders in the audience is to consider layering embedded fintech offerings onto the marketplace. This could take the form of enabling payments between buyers and sellers, facilitating loans, offering insurance, or any number of other financial products to make the experience better for the buyer and the seller. Not only will this make your marketplace more valuable to the users, but investors will likely give you a higher valuation multiple as well. If you look at the data on this slide, you can see that fintech-enabled marketplaces traded a meaningful premium to the average multiple of a marketplace in our index. Specifically, a fintech-enabled marketplace trades at seven times revenue versus the average of 5.6 times. One company who executed this playbook masterfully is Mercado Libre, who's basically the Amazon of Latin America. A couple of years before their IPO, they rolled out a suite of fintech products, including payment processing, lending, and asset management on top of their core marketplace. Fast forward to today, and their fintech revenue is one third of their total revenue, and it's growing almost twice as fast as the traditional marketplace business. According to many equity analysts, their fintech business is responsible for well over 50% of their $80 billion valuation. Another example is Carvana, the used car marketplace. In a nutshell, they use the car purchase as a wedge to sell very high margin financial products like loans and insurance to the car buyer. As you can see on the left side of the slide, the company earns about 50% of their gross profit from fintech products that are enabled by the core car transaction. The success of their fintech products has driven a huge surge in their stock price over the past two years, and the company is now worth over $50 billion. So the key takeaway is that as you are scaling, look for opportunities to embed fintech products onto your marketplace. It will make the platform more powerful to the end user and more valuable to investors. So as I said at the outset, we love investing in marketplaces, and we will continue to aggressively do so. Given the pandemic, these are hard times to start and build a company, but we're confident that many great businesses will emerge during this period. As it stands today, the total value of the Battery Marketplace Index is over $2.4 trillion. The 11 IPOs that took place over the past year added $400 billion of value to the Marketplace Index, and the pipeline of future IPO candidates looks great. 
Now, 2.4 trillion sounds like a lot, but we continue to be very bullish long-term and think we're just getting started. We're just scratching the surface on how marketplaces will change our lives and think this next generation of marketplaces that all of you in the audience are creating will make the current crop of marketplace companies look boring by comparison. My hope is that Battery will get to serve some of you on your journey, so please don't hesitate to reach out. My contact info and the contact info of my team are on this slide. So again, don't hesitate to reach out. Thanks for your time and enjoy the rest of the conference.